Would you like to learn about negotiating your first Cloud Architect offer? If so, this video is for you. Hi, my name is Mike Gibbs, and I've been an enterprise architect for a little over 25 years, and I've spent about two decades helping people just like you get your first tech job, get promoted in tech, negotiate a raise, what have you. And today we're going to talk about negotiating your first cloud architect offer. And of course, this would apply to an enterprise architect job, an AWS solutions architect job, and quite frankly, any other tech job. But we're going to discuss uh, a little bit about negotiating an offer. We'll talk about when you should negotiate, and more importantly, when you shouldn't negotiate. We'll We'll talk about uh, so we'll give you some tips and we'll talk about negotiating from a position of strength and weakness so congratulations you finally got hired as a cloud architect a solutions architect someone thought you had a good set of skills they liked who you are and they made you an offer congratulations you've done a lot of hard work and it paid off so you've got this offer what do you do this offer is a huge raise from your past life, most likely giving you at least a $100,000 raise over your previous job. You've got this raise, it's exciting. Do you leave, what do you do? You don't wanna leave any money on the table, but you also don't wanna lose this job. That's what we're gonna talk about in this video. So it's all about negotiating an, officer, an uh, uh, offer, when to negotiate, when not to, and taking it from a position of strength, a position of weakness, and then some best practices, of just some things to talk about, some negotiation tips. So the first thing we have to determine is if we should negotiate. And in order to do that, we have to ask ourselves a few questions. So we first have to understand how badly does the client want us and how good are we really? And the reason I say that is the more desirable you are, if they have the budget, the more willing they are to pay you more. If you were slightly desirable and you just marry me, you made the cutoff, you're not going to have the negotiation capability as if they loved you and couldn't wait to have you on your team. So the first thing I want to say is how badly do they, does the employer want you? And I can tell you how you're going to determine this. If you went on the interview and during the interview, they were leaning, they were nodding, they were smiling, they were telling you, wow, you're really solid. This is a very good position. You're desirable. If right after the interview, when you sent you that, when you sent the thank you note to the hiring manager, thanking them from the time and using it as an opportunity to sell yourself, if you got a response like that, that said it was so nice to meet you too. Uh, by the way, you'll be hearing for us soon. You are highly desirable. So, given those situations, chances are you have an opportunity to negotiate if you're desirable like that. But that doesn't mean you necessarily should. And we'll talk about more things to consider. Now, by comparison, if you were on the interview and the hiring manager really liked you as a person, the interviews went a little rough, the hiring manager said, I'm going to take a chance on you, or, you know, you seem to have some good assets here. You've got a lot of gaps. I think you'll grow into the position. If someone says something like that to you, do not, I'm going to say it again, do not try to negotiate. The person saw something in you and as a gift, they gifted you the position. They're taking a chance on you. Be thankful, be grateful. And a lot of times uh, we see someone, we really like them as a person, we're willing to take a chance on them. And then all of a sudden the person says, I want more money. We obviously aren't going to hire that person because they we probably shouldn't have hired them in the first place. But something told us to take a chance on that person. So think about that and where you're at uh, and about where you are. Now, if the interview went rock solid, you're awesome. It's another position accordingly. So the next thing that I want you to think about is the offer that you were given. Is it fair based upon your actual expertise and experience? Look, we all want to be paid 20, 30, 40, 50, a hundred million dollars a year. But what is really fair based upon what we can actually offer? So that's the thing to think about. And I'll give you two sides of this equation. You know, I've often had a student, we've trained them, they're fresh out of our program, and they've got an offer somewhere between 140 and 180, $180,000 per year, somewhere in that range, 140 to 180,000. 
That person, if they've not worked in tech before, generally speaking, should not touch that, not negotiate it. They should be very thankful for that offer. And I typically tell my students that. By comparison, you may have a very different background. For example, I've worked with people that had 10 and 15 years experience from companies like Cisco and IBM and Microsoft and Google, the best companies in the world. Now they may get a $250,000 offer and this is their first architect role, but that might be a little low when we can negotiate more. But see, it's based upon what the person can offer the company over there. Now, another thing that I want you to think about is, can you afford to lose the job? If you are jobless and someone gives you a good, reasonable offer that's going to make a life-changing decision for you, it's probably advisable not to get greedy to accept that. Because I want you to understand that the second you try to negotiate and say, I'm looking for more, you effectively said no to the offer. And now that company is willing to give that job or can give that job to somebody other than you. Now, this becomes especially problematic. And I've seen it where the company has two people that they've picked. One person's a little more senior, but they want more money. One person's a little more junior, but theoretically the company thinks they'll be paid less. The junior person says, I want more money. And now that company says, wait a second, if the junior person wants the same amount of money as someone more senior, let's go with the more senior person. And I've seen it happen. So, you know, think about that. Can you afford to do the job, to lose the job? If you can't, don't negotiate it. Now, Another thing that I want you to think about is positions of strengths and positions of weaknesses. So first, you know, we have to think about should we negotiate? And then the other is what is our position? So a position of strength is where you have the upper hand. So let's say I have someone. Now, this is a really strong candidate. This person has three offers. They've got a great resume. They've got a strong professional brand. Now, in most cases, we can do some negotiation here. Now, another time we have a candidate who's been published, presented at many conferences. They've got a large following. They've been in major articles presented everywhere. Everyone knows who they are. Maybe they're a principal sales engineer. They've held patents. They've been, and, and they're known everywhere. This is a position of strength. Because even if this person loses this opportunity at this company, which they won't most likely if they negotiate it right, they'll have so many other opportunities that it doesn't matter and they're already employed in a good position. That's a position of strength. So when you're in a position of strength, I like to take a best alternative to a negotiated agreement so I don't negotiate anything goofy and say, if I don't negotiate an agreement here, what's my best option? With two jobs, I've got two jobs. If I lose one through the process of negotiation, I still have the other. It's not there. So always determine you know, what you can do. Now, let's talk about negotiating the position of weaknesses. You know, either don't try or do it softly. And here's what I mean softly. Someone's in a position of weakness. They've gotten their first offer. It's a little less than they want it to be. They've, they've done all the research. They know what they're worth. They know what they can show. And there'll be some tips we'll talk about later. This is how you negotiate softly from a position of weakness. So is there any room uh, on the table for salary that we could talk about here? I'm not saying I won't say no to the position, but uh, is there a way there's more? Now, by doing it that way, negotiating softly, making the ask very softly, you're not saying no. So from a position of weakness, you know, obviously there's some work to do, there's some planning to do, there's some things to think about, but be soft because you're not in a position of strength. And, you know, like anything else, whether it's in any engagement, any type of conflict, a courtroom, a battle, you always have to determine your position of strength, weakness is the card you're dealt, and then you can build your strategy upon that. So in this particular case, let's say there is an opportunity uh, to do things. There is an opportunity to negotiate. So there's lots of things we want to do here, lots of things we want to plan. I'm going to tell you right now, before you even think about negotiating, plan that negotiation. Plan what you'll do if you can't negotiate it. Plan what would happen if you would lose it. Plan what your best alternatives are. Plan, plan, plan. 
And we're also, in addition to the plan, in order to create our strategy, we're going to have to do some reconnaissance. We're going to have to do some information, information gathering, etc. So the first thing we're going to have to plan is we're going to have to research the company that we've applied to that made us the offer, its primary competitors, and we have to see what they pay. Now, let's say we look at what the average pay is, the median average, for example, pay at uh, the company we've applied for and its competitors. Now we know what the average pay is, for example. Now that gives us a place to start an analysis. Now we don't just want to know pay, we want to know total compensation. Because there may be salary, there'll typically bonuses, there could be stock grants, restricted stop units, uh, stock options, and so many other things along the way. So we need to know total compensation. Now, here's where the analysis comes in. And here I'm going to tell you what somebody told you to, not to do your whole life. I need you to compare yourself directly to the average person, for example, in that company. So if the average solutions architect, for example, in that company, the average cloud solutions architect is earning $190,000 a year, compare yourself to that $190,000 architect. Are you better? If so, how are you better? Are you worse? If so, how are you worse? So understand you and your comparison. So if the average pay is this and you're getting better than average already and you're not and you're only average or less than average, you're in a pretty good position. Chances are you don't have that much room. But what if you are much better than average and they give you an average pay and you have the ability to negotiate it. Well, now we've got something to work with. So I want you to compare yourself to others. I want you to identify your strengths, your weaknesses, for example, and I want you to understand what strengths you have and what their value actually is. For example, let's say you've been in sales for a while and now you're applying to a solutions architect job that's pre-sales and they've made you an offer. Well, now you have another set of skills that could help make you worth much more than the average cloud solutions architect. So we want to talk about what is it? Maybe you've got a lot of business acumen. Maybe you've got a lot of executive experience or leadership experience, something that'll make you a better architect. So consider that when comparing yourself to an average. Do you have extremely strong business acumen? If so, that could be worth, let's say, upwards of six figures to a cloud architect salary or an enterprise architect salary. So I need you to know where you are and compare yourself to the others in that organization and see where you stack up on the pay equation. Now, you really need to be objective here. You can't think you're a superhero when you're not. You can't think you're a lion when you're a kitten. So be real here. And what I really want you to think about to really put it in perspective is if you interviewed you, what would you pay you from the perspective of the hiring manager? And that's going to be what you're going to be using, what you're going to use as a, as a starting point or a goal, typically speaking. So I need you to be clear about what that skill is and what you can do for the company. And I'm also going to need to make you to make it clear to the client. So for example, if you're able to talk to the, to, when you're talking to the hiring manager, you might want to say something that helps them understand why. So maybe you've been in sales, maybe you were a sales rep for a long period of time, and now you're in a pre-sales role and you can close twice as many deals because you've got good strong sales. Well, maybe the average to a solutions architect can close $40 million of sales and you can do $80 million of sales with a margin of say 50%. Well, if that's the case, you're worth $40 million more to the company than the average cloud architect or solutions architect in that pre-sales role. So you can get more, typically speaking. And that's the secret. That's what we need to be able to do. We need to show and tell. We need to show that client, you know, where you stand, what you deserve based upon what you can offer and the value that you provide. So assume your skills, compare yourself to others and learn what you can actually do. For example, I had a student that was went into a pre-sales role and he was a sales rep first. 
He used that, and it was at a major consulting company, to get his first senior solutions architect role as his first tech job because they interviewed him and they saw the sales skills and they knew in a pre-sales role that level of sales would have been good. There's a lot of other things you can know. Maybe, for example, you've got experience in networking that makes you more valuable or security that makes you more valuable. Whatever it is, find that thing that you can, assuming it's real, and show the client how it's helpful to them. So that's going to be something that's going to assist you along the way. Now, when you ask for more, I want you to do it in a very clear way. I don't want you to look greedy. That's not going to help you at all. I want you to show what's in it for the hiring manager to hire you. Here's an example. I had worked with someone that had been working in a bank for a period of time before his first cloud architecture role. And we talked about him saying, that his 10 years experience working at ABC Bank would help him better understand the organization's financial clients better. And that that expertise would help him design more efficient architectures, which would drive more value to the clients that would ultimately close more revenue. This person did incredibly well because they were able to show their financial industry acumen and business acumen and how that would help them in the architecture career. And the manager saw more than what was grossly obvious on the surface. So when you're going to clarify your ask, let's say you want 10%. And you were saying that given my expertise in this, 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 you can do this for the client and you're looking for an additional 10%. Don't specify that exact 10%, how you want to get it. You may say, I'm looking for 10%, but understand that in a business, the hiring manager has different levers they can pull to get you that 10%. For example, you might be given a number of restricted stock units per year. That could be 10% of your salary, for example. And that might be easy. It might come out of additional budget. Or maybe, for an example, they can move you into a higher grade at the same base salary, but that higher grade has a 10% grade, a bonus that's 10% of your base salary. And you could have an opportunity like that. So there's lots of ways they can play with your salary. So going back to that, my 10 years experience working at Alpha Bravo Charlie Bank will help me better understand your financial clients. And that expertise will help me better design solutions for your clients that'll deliver more value and help me close more deals. Because of that, I'm looking for approximately 10% more in some form of compensation. Could we talk about that? Now doing it, you didn't specify the exact form. They've given them wiggle room and a wiggle room is a lot, is very helpful when you're looking for more money. So, if you have to negotiate a salary or you want to negotiate, make sure it makes sense. Think about what you can do for the client. Position what you can do for the client and know your worth. These are some tips that I hope you can use to negotiate a higher salary on your next offer for that great cloud architect job or great security architect job, enterprise architect job, or any other job you want. If you've enjoyed this video, uh, please give it a like, subscribe to our channel, and hit the bell to be notified of new videos to assist you in your cloud architecture career, security architecture career, enterprise architecture, or any other architecture career for that matter. And if you'd like to become a cloud architect, security architect, AI architect, or any other kind of architect, join us for a free architecture webinar. We hold one every single week. In these webinars, we'll talk about what we do in the role, the skills you need, how to bypass HR so you don't get auto-rejected. And you can ask any questions you want about any of these architecture careers because these webinars are free and live on Zoom. You can register for one of these free webinars in the description of this video. There'll be a link. While you're in the description of this video, we've got a lot of free things like how to win the interview, for example, uh, documents or documents on how to become a cloud architect. All you have to do is sign up and they'll be emailed to you. So I hope to see you in another webinar. I hope to see you in another video. And I hope you negotiate a much higher salary on your next Cloud Architect job offer. Take care and I look forward to seeing you soon.